All right. Thank you so much, everyone, for joining us for the 2023 virtual ASNA conference today. Today, we will have 37 feed talk presentations in the areas of program delivery, social marketing, technology, evaluation, equity, and partnerships. Each presentation will last around seven minutes to share the main highlights of the work. Please use the question and answer function for any questions and answers that you might have, and they will be answered in a written format by the speakers. All sessions will be recorded and eventually posted on an ASNA platform. We will not be sending out CEU options for the virtual conference. Thank you so much for attending, and let's go ahead and get started with our first speaker. Thank you so much. Uh, good morning, everyone. Um, I'm Gina Wood. I'm an assistant professor with the W Extension Family Nutrition Program, which is comprised of FNEP and SNAP Ed. And um, my colleague, Samantha Shali Brzozowska from the Office of Health Services Research in the School of Public Health at WVU is my co-presenter. So we're really excited to be able to kick off the day by sharing a little bit about our partnerships that have facilitated our produce prescription program work in West Virginia. Next slide, please. The Pharmacy West Virginia program was initiated back in 2016 by two medical providers at a free and charitable clinic who were treating many patients with type 2 diabetes and other chronic diseases who also lacked access to fresh food due to income and transportation limitations. Next slide, please. They partnered with a local urban farming group and the SNAP Ed Health Educator in their area to bring fresh produce and nutrition education to the clinic for 16 weeks for their initial 35 patient cohort. They saw a significant reduction in A1C through the program, so they continued for several years, increasing the number of patients every year. A handful of other clinics who heard about the program implemented similar programs using a variety of models, but a common factor among all of them was the use of SNAP-Ed and FNAP educators for the nutrition education component. Next slide, please. The program has four pillars that are essential for program success. Uh, a healthcare partner who's willing to recruit and refer patients and is willing to be the host site, a partnering farmer or aggregator who can supply the produce, and obviously a nutrition education component, which we supply with FNEP and SNAP-Ed, and also a funding source for the weekly produce. Next slide, please. SNAP-Ed program has been engaged in food access work for many years and has developed lots of relationships with other agencies involved in this work throughout the state. So it seemed like a natural fit and the right time to um, begin to work a little bit more closely with our clinical partners to build some more formal infrastructure to support the expansion of pharmacies. So we led a group of partners to apply for a large food access grant from the Walmart Foundation, which included a proposal to expand pharmacy to 12 new counties in 2020 and 2021. Next slide, please. The initial partners included the founding clinicians who provided consultation related to planning and implementation, the West Virginia Department of Agriculture who provided guidance around engaging local growers, our WVU Food Justice Lab who provided guidance around evaluating, evaluating the program from the grower perspective. We also engaged our state's largest aggregators, Turnrow Appalachian Farm Collective and Sprouting Farms to supply the produce in counties where there was limited local capacity. It was important to us that we use pharmacy and the other food access programs within the grant to support local farmers so that the grant funding flowed directly back into the local food economy in West Virginia. This led to a partnership with the WV Farmers Market Association, who sustained the program in 2022 through a COVID relief grant through the state health department. But from the beginning, uh, the Office of Health Services Research in the School of Public Health was really the backbone of support for the program. They helped prepare the grant proposal, provided guidance throughout the IRB process, and they continue to lead the program evaluation as well as play a central role on the state level planning committee. OHSR has a 40 year history of working with healthcare partners to provide technical assistance related to quality improvement in the healthcare setting, but more recently they've developed a system to provide support for the collection, tracking, and reporting of data on a wide variety of community based health programs such as pharmacy. So I'm going to turn it over to Samantha to share a little bit more about their work in that area. Next slide.
The West Virginia Health Connection is a um, initiative that is ran by the Office of Health Services Research that you know was mentioning. Um, it is in partnership with the Bureau for Public Health Division of Health Promotion and Chronic Disease Prevention um, at the state. Um, West Virginia Health Connection helps with addressing long-standing challenges and working across clinical and community settings. Um, with this initiative, folks are knowledgeable of the programs that exist. Um, it allows for data to be collected in a HIPAA-compliant software, um, which allows for data tracking, reporting, and referrals. Um, it also has a front-facing public website that is wvhealthconnection.com that showcases that program availability and allows for logistics to be um, disseminated out to partners. Um, along with all of those components, we do spend a lot of time with helping to develop referral models, allowing for patients to be connected to those programs. We help um, local level um, partners with reporting back to funders and keeping any recognition that they need to um, to keep their program going. Um, another component that we really help with is, of course, data reporting, but also attaching anything that we can to billing um, and other um, requirements that take into play. Um, on the next slide, um, you'll see some preliminary um, results um, for the pharmacy program. Um, those results um, for 2020 and 2021 um, were related to 165 participants. Um, those, that cohort of participants that happened, um, we saw almost one point reduction um, in A1C. We also saw reduction in total cholesterol, um, as well as um, some impact on BMI or body weight for those folks, um, losing about one pound over the 15 week span. Um, we also were able to allow for 88,000 pounds of fresh produce to be um, disseminated out to communities. And we did see an increase, of course, with that produce going out in fruit and vegetable consumption. In 2022, um, so far, we are seeing over 340 participants were served across 14 sites in 12 counties. Um, next slide. Um, on this slide, you'll be able to see the presence within West Virginia. This is just a quick snapshot. And it's, of course, um, as folks are starting to collaborate, um, we're seeing more and more locations popping up in the state, even for 2023. So far, we have um, 26 site locations that had some type of pharmacy program in the state um, last year, which is covering about 23 of our 55 counties in the state. And you can see here, it's pretty widely dispersed across the entire area. Next slide. With having a statewide infrastructure and data approach um, that was mentioned earlier, data briefs are completed annually at the county and state level. Um, we also are able to develop policy briefs that are created um, and include the data results, but also include policy recommendations at the state level. Um, we have hosted a policy clinic series for healthcare partners in the state to really educate them on the pharmacy program and produce prescription programming in general. This is available through an ongoing um, learning management system, and this included three sessions and CMEs were offered. Additionally, um, our state planning team for pharmacy is developing a nonprofit um, to allow for a statewide infrastructure and to allow for coordination to be paid for. Um, furthermore, we have developed partnerships with Medicaid managed care organizations in terms of providing funding, assisting with recruitment, and increasing referrals. We are currently working to expand those partnerships with those MCOs in 2023 and have really developed some additional conversation there. Um, on the next slide, you'll see our contact information um, for Gina and I, as well as the Pharmacy West Virginia planning team. Um, towards the bottom, you'll see that is the public facing website for the pharmacy initiative. That's pharmacywv.com. Um, and thank you all for your time today. Welcome, everyone. My name is Tammy McMurdo, and I'm a direct education program manager for the CalFresh Healthy Living. Um, University of California State Office, which is one of the SNAP-Ed um, programs in California. Hi, everyone. My name is Karina Macias, and I am the program manager with the CalFresh Healthy Living University of California 
Cooperative Extension in Fresno and Madera counties. We are one of the local implementing agencies that provides SNAP ed programming locally to the CalFresh Healthy Living University of California. Today, we'll provide you with an overview of the SNAP ed educator self assessment tool. Next slide, please. Before we get started, we wanted you all to think about how many skills or knowledge areas it takes for a SNAP ed nutrition educator to perform their basic job functions. I'll give you all a few seconds um, just to think about that. If you guessed more than 100, then you're on the right track. It takes approximately 140 different skills and knowledge areas for our educators to effectively provide SNAP ed programming. Next slide, please. As our SNAP ed work expanded into a more comprehensive approach, we found that we needed an assessment tool that captured all of the skills and knowledge areas our community educators needed to successfully deliver SNAP ed programming. Some of the topics um, and skills our educators needed expertise in included community nutrition, classroom management, garden-based education, conducting needs assessments and evaluations, youth and community engagement, among many others. To address this, we set out to develop a tool to aid our educators and their supervisors in understanding the different knowledge and skill sets the new and experienced educators require, and to also identify areas for professional development. Next slide, please. Our tool development process started with us reviewing existing educator competency assessments to gather ideas about content and format for our tool. Next, we generated topic areas and corresponding competencies for both new and experienced educators. Then we went on um, and we submitted our draft tool to some of our subject matter experts within our organization for review and they provided edits and we incorporated those edits. Our last step was to finalize the tool content and to make it available to our local programs for pilot testing. Next slide, please. Now let's take a look at the format and layout of the tool. As you'll see here, uh, each competency area will begin at the top of a page and we'll have the key for self braiding and the timeline for improvement. The key is noted uh, in the gray shaded box at the top of the page, which is labeled with arrow number one. Next slide, please. The competencies are organized into entry level and advanced level, uh, which you can see here next to arrow number two. Next slide, please. Each competency area lists knowledge, skills, and or ability criteria. Some are further broken down into subcompetencies, which you can see here circled at the bottom left. There is also a self-rating scale and a timeline for improvement for each competency and subcompetency, which you can see here circled at the top right. The self-rating scale options are needs training, practice, proficient, skilled, and not applicable. The timeline for improvement options are three, six, or 12 month timeframe. Next slide, please. The impact of using the educator self-assessment tool is to inform interview panel questions when hiring new educators, identify gaps in knowledge and skills, and to prioritize trainings for new educators to develop goals for growth or development of expertise related to job duties, identify areas of strength and expertise and provide opportunities for leadership or peer-to-peer -peer mentoring. And this tool can also be used to inform a new supervisor of the staff's knowledge, skills, and professional development goals, as well as allows them to further identify new goals for the staff. Next slide, please. The expected outcomes of 
using this tool is that it will result in a highly skilled workforce of educators across SNAP-Ed. Use of this tool also supports excellence in program delivery by standardizing the knowledge and skill set needed by educators to successfully and consistently deliver SNAP-Ed programming. Next slide, please. We are currently in the pilot testing phase and are using the tool statewide with our educators. We would like to expand the use of the tool to other SNAP Ed programs as well. And if you're interested in contributing to our pilot testing of the tool, we invite you to download it uh, by following the link provided here on this slide and or by using your phone to scan the QR code on the right. After using the tool with your educators, you will also be asked to complete the feedback survey. Next slide, please. Thank you for taking the time to learn about our tool. If you have any additional questions about our educator self-assessment tool, please contact us at the email uh, address that's listed on this slide. And thank you so much for your time today. Hi everyone, I am Macy Helm from the University of Nevada, Reno Extension, and I have uh, my co-presenters here on the uh, session today, Dr. Annie Lindsay, Dr. Jason Crandall, and Jennifer Wood. And our presentation is Improving Nutrition Outcomes for Older Adults, a revised module for bingo size. Um, and this is a collaboration between University of Nevada, Reno Extension and Western Kentucky University. Next slide, slide please. So for those that don't know, Bingo Size is an education program that was developed by Dr. Jason Crandall at Western Kentucky University, and it combines the fun game of bingo with exercise and health information as an effective and fun way to get older adults moving, eating healthier, and socializing. And Bingo, bingo Size is designed to be played two times a week on non-consecutive days for 10 weeks total, which e with each session being 45 to 60 minutes. And within Bingo Size, there are three workshops available, um, exercise only, exercise and falls prevention education, and exercise and nutrition education. And the program itself is available in both English and Spanish. Next slide. And within SNAP education, Bingo Size works really well because it can be implemented where older adults eat, live, learn, and play, and really in community centers and where older adults congregate. There's also an opportunity for great sustainability within Bingo Size because of the ease of the train the trainer model. Most sites that are serving older adults already are playing games of bingo or have bingo going on at their property. And so we're able to integrate Bingo Size into the regularly scheduled uh, bingo games through that train the trainer model. And within SNAPED, there's of course a focus on medium term indicators to produce behavior change outcomes which really led to this collaboration between UNR Extension and Western Kentucky. Next slide. And so through this partnership, uh, we really identified the opportunity to make the nutrition uh, education component of Bingo Size a bit more robust. So currently in the SNAP-Ed toolkit, the falls prevention and the physical activity modules are included, but the nutrition module is not. And the original nutrition module was primarily based on short-term outcomes. And within our state, um, our state agency really prioritizes medium-term <laughs> behavior change outcomes, which led to this service agreement between Extension and my colleague, Dr. Annie Lindsay, who will jump in in a second, and Western Kentucky. And we developed a large question bank of about 150 questions to really facilitate that behavior change in our older adults who are engaging in bingo size nutrition. Next slide. So the first thing we did was review the bingo size existing nutrition module against the indicators in the framework and found many to be short term and not necessarily impacting medium term behaviors. Next, we did a lit review and included searches on other curricula um, for older adults, USDA nutrition guidelines, etc, and identified critical curricula themes that needed to be covered in the content. Uh, we conducted an internal and external peer reviews to finalize the 153 question database, narrowed it down to 103, including the questions, response options, answers, and brief learning using scripts and prompts. And we did this by engaging expert reviewers, a clinical RD for content um, who specialized in aging, an aging expert for older adult uh, literacy, and our nutrition coordinator, Macy, for SNAP-Ed integration. 
We then reviewed the overall content for distribution of the questions weighted by topic and organized them to fit into the existing bingo size, bingo size module, yet we wanted to ensure the flow of learning uh, could still promote behavior change. And then finally, we added some media images uh, where necessary. And then we uploaded it to the Kentucky's bingo size system for piloting. We conducted a process evaluation, sort of a pre-pilot, um, both in-person and virtually to assess the logistics and tools and then some content. We drafted concepts for key takeaway messaging for future handouts and then had it reviewed by a RD who is board certified in gerontology. Um, and then currently we are conducting four pilots that are underway. Next slide, please. Um, <clears throat> As part of the pilots, uh, just a couple of things on the results we, we asked, is there any reason that you might not be able to apply the ideas or messages shared in the lesson after, after they uh, participate in the pilot? And from what we've seen so far, very few respondents stated on any of the questions that they could not apply the concepts. Um, and those that did, it was usually because they were not the primary shopper, which we screened for. We also got a lot of feedback such as, I didn't know this, this was new to me. For example, older adults that may have learned nutrition differently growing up, like protein is the primary source of energy or rinsing chicken is good practice. So they really felt like this was new information to them. And then we incorporated technical and logistical feedback into future uh, iterations. Next slide, please. And then our quantitative data, uh, just looking at that, we also pulled the participants after each questions and asked, was the question and response clearly understandable? And uh, most all of them said, uh, gave yeses to all of them. So they did understand. And if there were issues, we fixed those in the next inter iteration. Um, we asked them on a scale of one to five, how likely are you to apply these ideas and messages at home with five being very likely? And the mean score came out to 4.72. And then lastly, we did a pre-post survey and found significant increases in uh, fruits eat, eaten per day. It was based on a half a cup, a full cup, whatever. Uh, vegetables eaten each day, an increase in the kind of fruits that they were eating each day and the kind of uh, uh, an increase in the kind of vegetables. And then uh, we didn't see as much change in buying foods with lower added sugar or no sugar. We're planning to use a little bit better tool when we do the, the quasi-experimental. Uh, last slide, please. So our next steps um, is that we are uh, looking for funding now that we've done all of the process evaluation to uh, conduct a quasi-experimental study. We hope to include uh, multi-state uh, as part of the pilots. So um, if any of you would like to be part of that or are currently using the older nutrition module, uh, we would love to work with you and ultimately uh, you know, get it up on the toolkit for others to use. I think we have a thank you slide at the end there. Oh, we have contact, next slide. So here's our contact information. If you are interested in piloting um, this next uh, iteration of the nutrition module for bingo size, please uh, contact uh, myself um, um, or Macy. Thank you. Hi everyone, thanks for having us. My name is Mary Catherine Gould and I'm sitting here with Alicia Fox and we are in Huntington, West Virginia at Marshall University. Uh, I'm a professor here in the Department of Dietetics and Alicia is the director of our nutrition education program. Um, next slide, please. So our nutrition education program, we've been in existence for about 15 years and we primarily um, provide education to children in kindergarten, first and second grade. Um, but we wanted to expand our services into another area where we felt like um, our um, state could use a little help. And so uh, West Virginia has a pretty high rate of substance use disorder. And so um, we were trying to um, provide nutrition education to individuals in recovery centers. <laughs> and so as you see on this slide, there are a number of reasons that nutrition education is beneficial for those in recovery. Um, I won't go through all of these, but we'll get to actually what we have 
um, accomplished over the last couple of years. So next slide, please. Um, so we were thinking about expanding into um, substance use disorder um, category. And what we found is a location um, that's an in-house recovery program. So this recovery program has both men and women, although they do live separately. And so we decided we'd like to offer a nutrition education. And we really started with the Eat Smart, Be Active program. So this is a series of nine classes that include um, kitchen skills, meal planning, budgeting, grocery shopping. I'm sure a lot of you are familiar with this particular curriculum. And this is where we actually got started. So um, the men and women participated in separate programs. Um, unfortunately, all of the meals were provided by the facility. So it does present a challenge when we're talking about nutrition education, but the participants in the program aren't really able to cook their own foods. Um, they are or they were able to purchase their snacks. So we hope that we kind of influence some of their decisions with their snack purposes. But each of the classes um, consider or included a tasting um, part to it and also physical activity component. And of course, we provided incentives at the conclusion of each class. So you can see what some of those incentives were. Next slide. So to evaluate our program, we use the adult participant entry form. And I was pretty excited about this one because we did have a 24 hour recall. And that gave us a little bit better understanding of what our participants were consuming. Um, this form also asked about physical activity and any nutrition supplementation that the participants might be taking. We also did a pre and post adult questionnaire where we asked um, basic food frequency questions and uh, asked about their food purchasing behaviors. Of course, at this particular time, a lot of the uh, participants did not purchase their own foods, but um, kind of asking about um, past behaviors. So participants were asked to complete the post questionnaire if they completed at least six of the nine classes. We did have um, some differences in individuals that started the class and those that finished the series of nine classes because people would finish the program, the recovery program. Um, and so we did ask that if they had completed at least six of the classes that they do finish the post questionnaire. So next slide. Okay. All right, so our findings. So the, as she, Mary Catherine was saying, the 24 hour recall was very interesting. Um, one of the, the big takeaways from this is despite saying that they, they did not consume soda every day, when we did the 24 hour recall, we found out that they were in fact actually consuming soda um, multiple times throughout the day. We found that there were high amounts of energy, energy dense foods, highly processed, low fiber and convenience foods. So even though their foods were prepared at the facilities, they were able to sometimes go to a convenience store. They would make visits while they were out as the group and be able to make purchases um, while they were out. And the most frequent um, vegetables that were consumed and mentioned were corn and beans. In the pre-program uh, questionnaire, we this wasn't, we were very surprised about this. There was a low consumption of fruits, vegetables, and dairy, and there was minimal planning for shopping, um, which this was not a surprise again, because in the facility where they were, they, the meals were provided for them, so they, they didn't have to plan for those meals. Um, Post-program post improvement, so there was an increase in exercise and um, strength uh, strength, strengthening uh, muscles was one of the big reports for workouts um, mentioned. They also mentioned increase of milk or soy milk, and then the increase in planning meals before grocery shopping. So this we don't have a lot of clarification on, but one of the things is maybe as they're thinking about when they're out and they're starting to prepare more of their meals, 
or when they're out able to purchase some quick on the go foods, that this might be where that increased planning is um, coming into play. Next slide, please. So the number of surveys um, completed, that was a very, oh, that was a low number. Um, not everyone completed the pre and post um, questionnaire and the names weren't always document, documented. So this made matching the surveys difficult. Um, dairy consumption was increased as mentioned before and smoothies were one of the tastings that we provided um, and they were discussed in the class. So this is something that we believe probably impacted the increase in dairy consumption is making the smoothies, and then they started wanting to prepare the smoothies as well. Uh, due to this, obviously, as we mentioned, being an in-house program, there was little control over food purchase and preparation. So we weren't surprised to not see the fact that there was a minimal improvement in the consumption of healthier foods just due to the lack of them being able to um, purchase those on their own. And next slide, please. So what's next? Um, there is a limited amount of SNAP-Ed approved curriculum for a nutrition and substance abuse disorder. Um, throughout this progress, we have since this pilot joined a nationwide collaborative and we are now working with several other programs on finding curriculum that is for the recovery community because there's such a need. Um, down the road, something that this group is working on is we would like to be able to have a SNAP-Ed approved curriculum. So that is something that we're hoping a collaboration down the road, and we, we're going to have to think about the next steps of that. Um, we are, that program that we provided here in addition to what we've done since then, it was something that we had additional funding outside of um, SNAP-Ed. So we were able to provide using an additional curriculum focusing just on nutrition recovery for a program here, but it has shown us that we have a need here and we would like to expand and we hope in time there will be something that we can do that is also SNAP-Ed incorporated. And then a goal is we want to continue to partnership with other recovery programs and then expand this to not only the individuals in recovery, but also to work with the um, staff, cooks, administration, anyone who's involved in that process of making, uh, that has an influence on the menu, the meals prepared, shopping, so that we can help incorporate what we're teaching in class to also what they're being fed for in their facility. And I think that is about it. So thank you so much. Hello. My name is Bethany Pratt, and I'm here with Dr. Nicole Brazil. We are representing a multidisciplinary team from the University of Kentucky who has been working for the past two years to develop a recovery garden toolkit. The toolkit is the product of a substance use recovery garden pilot program initiated by the Nutrition Education Program and accompanying community of practice facilitated by the Community and Leadership Development Department and Nutrition Education Program. Our goal is to support extension personnel providing programming at substance use recovery centers in Kentucky. Next slide. Um, hi, my name is Nicole Brazil, and um, I wanna take you guys back in time to the fall of 2019. So, and if you can remember pre-COVID time, this was that. Um, I just arrived at the University of Kentucky at that time as an extension specialist in the area of community <laughs> and leadership development. And I got a call from Bethany Pratt here, who invited me to come visit her garden program at the Healing Place in Louisville, Kentucky. So these recovery garden programs are extension-led gardening, but also nutrition education projects that are happening at substance use recovery centers all around the state. So similar to what we just heard in the previous presentation, but these also incorporate a specific aspect of gardening. And so the idea is to provide residents with both information about how you can use nutrition to support your recovering bodies. And actually SNAP-Ed at the University of Kentucky does have a curriculum that they have developed specifically for that. Uh, but also at the same time to gain gardening skills so that they can both produce their own food and benefit as well from the therapeutic effects of working with both nature and their peers in order to nurture plants and see through this collective goal. This builds confidence, it teaches responsibility, and it also helps with the recovery process. And I should mention as part of our team at the University of Kentucky, we do have a faculty member specifically in extension um, with a focus on substance use recovery as well. 
So when I arrived at the, at the healing place, I was quite impressed by the scale at which Bethany was gardening with the residents. They were, let's say, about a half a dozen in-ground beds and a very large hoop house. And she was busy instructing a group of around 20 women, as she did every week. So the issue that she and others in her situation faced was that the setup wasn't particularly sustainable. The center had basically handed the entire gardening program off to extension, and the gardeners were rotated very frequently, meaning it was really hard to build up a base of knowledge. As Bethany was approaching maternity leave, it was unclear how to ensure that the program would continue and how to make it as impactful as it could be. So this was the thorny challenge. What would you do? Well, our objective was to figure out how we could build a structure where residents could take on both leadership of the project and also to identify some strategies for how we could build a more equitable partnership with the recovery center. Beth, they tried out some of these ideas that we came up with and they helped. But then as we brought other extension agents and SNAP ed educators together to discuss it, we realized that these were actually extremely common problems across the different recovery gardens that existed in um, the state. And as you can see from this um, map right here, here is where we had at the time recovery gardens that were happening. Um, and so what we decided what we needed to develop was a recovery garden toolkit that shared these best practices. And we also needed to build a community of practice so educators could learn from each other and support each other in what turns out to be pretty complex work. Next slide, please. So as our community of practice was meeting and convening, um, the University of Kentucky Extension Service was also in the process of performing a statewide community needs assessment. The results of that needs assessment showed that supporting folks in substance use recovery was a top priority for Kentuckians. This need was further reflected in the work already happening by extension personnel. Approximately 60% of NEP and FNEP assistants were already teaching nutrition classes at substance use recovery centers, and more collaborative gardens were being installed across the state to connect folks in substance use recovery with the resources of extension. What we have found is that the opportunities provided by gardens go beyond any one program area within extension. Recovery gardens offer a wide range of opportunities for extension cross-program collaboration, as well as opportunities to include certified extension volunteers like master gardeners into programming, expanding the resources and reach of extension. Next slide. Okay, so this toolkit that our group developed over the last couple of years brings together both evidence-based practices in the field of community leadership development with those in the area of substance use recovery, along with the lived experiences, knowledge, and the tips of extension agents and the SNAP ed educators who've been doing this work already on the ground. And this is not just so it's clear a how-to guide on how you set up this particular type of a community garden, what to plant, when to harvest, etc. On the contrary, it's focused on capacity building for those who already have the gardening and nutrition knowledge and are implementing these projects. So in fact, this kind of heralds back to the earlier conversation that we were having um, today about the educator assessment tool, right? So this is a whole other broader set of capacities um, in these other areas that we need to develop. So um, sections in that recovery garden toolkit um, include, how do you help your gardeners bond with each other? How do you build up their confidence and their leadership skills in running this program? How do you establish a productive working relationship with a recovery center, including all of those various types of positions that were mentioned before? How do you use destigmatizing language in your programming? And how do you strengthen the already beneficial aspects of community garden for, the, for those in recovery? So this might include activities on facilitating mindfulness in the garden, which we have. Um, we also have sections on how to celebrate and publicize these successes. And then how do you bring residents more deeply into the community-based work of extension even after you leave the center? Because we know that that deep community embeddedness is important for people in recovery. So we've had a lot of work, fun working on this unique toolkit. Um, and we're gonna pass off to the next slide, to Bethany. So our group, um, our community of practice um, completed our toolkit in January of this year. It's currently in peer review. Um, and while we were doing the kind of wrapping things up and moving forward, we, we hosted an introductory meeting for all extension personnel um, focusing on the recovery garden toolkit. Our target audiences were extension agents, 
and NEP and FNEP assistance with the focus of building that cross-program collaboration. At the introductory meeting, we met many more Extension personnel who were initiating gardening and nutrition education programming at substance use recovery centers. This really spoke to us of the need and the timeliness of the toolkit. Due to the very large number of interested folks, um, we actually revamped our initial training plan to incorporate all of the additional participants. So starting in March um, this month, we're expanding our community of practice to welcome all the new folks and use the toolkit resources to guide bi-weekly online learning and support sessions for agents and FNEP assistants who are interested in implementing both a or are already implementing a recovery garden and nutrition education programming at a substance use um, recovery center. Thanks to the Kentucky Department of Agriculture Specialty Crop Block Grant, we have funding for approximately 20 gardens in 2023, and then the nutrition education program will continue to support garden funding beyond the grant cycle. Once the toolkit is completed, we will also host an in-person training to continue fostering connections within our community of practice, as well as to provide um, recovery garden implementers a deeper dive into the resources we have created. Next slide. So if you are interested or in your state, if there is this type of recovery garden, um, uh, gardening, recovery gardening that is happening, and you'd love to connect up with us, here is our contact information. Go ahead and take a screenshot of our email addresses, if you don't mind. We would love to connect with you and support the work you're doing elsewhere as well. Thanks so much. Hello, everyone. I'm excited to share with you today the process that we use to transform a face-to-face -face course called Today's Mom into Happy Healthy Baby, a, an online course targeting limited resource pregnant moms implemented via SNAP education in Mississippi. So my name is Virginia Gray. I'm at California State University, Long Beach, and I'm presenting on behalf of my co-authors, Sandra Parmer, at Alabama Cooperative Extension and Sylvia Bird at Mississippi State Extension. So today's mom is a face-to-face -face course that was developed by FNAC practitioners at Alabama Cooperative Extension System at Auburn University and adopted in 2018 by Mississippi State Extension for face-to-face -face delivery. We actually um, kind of surreptitiously uh, began the process of converting this course to an online before the pandemic due to barriers that we saw in attending face-to-face -face classes such as limited time and variable work schedules and limited childcare. Next slide, please. So we use the 6D model of project management to guide development. In the discover and define phase, we used research both with limited resource Mississippians and literature and an educator survey to help direct decisions around content updates. And uh, also the literature really and encouraged us to focus on interactive tools and skill building, just like we would in a face-to-face -face environment and look for ways to create interactivity amongst our participants. In the design and development phase, we brought together a team that had wide expertise that is really particularly necessary for an online course. So we had a, a curriculum content expert, an e-learning expert, a video development team, and an evaluation specialist. We used an iterative process to create these modules while conducting formative evaluation along the way with using both focus groups and interviews with members of the target audience to help us tweak and just really refine the process. And so then the course was delivered in a pilot format um, to 10 participants via SNAP-Ed and carried out by uh, Extension staff via Mississippi State Extension. Next slide, please. So I'd like you to show you a little bit about the course. This is a summary of the six lessons uh, in, the, in the yellow, you see each lesson, and then we've included a spotlight on one of the lessons so you can get a better idea of what each included. So if we're looking at lesson two, each lesson started with a short welcome video. This was with an extension educator introducing the topics. And then there were interactive activities. So in this lesson, uh, there was an interactive activity where pregnant moms could learn about how to cope with pregnancy discomforts. A short video focused on managing stress, both giving people individual ways to think about managing stress, but also um, ways to reach out and look for support in their communities. 
And then there was an exercise video in each lesson as well, and an interactive activity. And this one focused on building a healthy breakfast with recipes. And the lessons all end with a wrap up and an opportunity for participants to set goals. Next slide, please. So the next few slides show some examples of screenshots within the course. So see, these are some of the interactive games. You can see a drag and drop on the left in which participants are practicing what they learn about nutrients that are important for pregnancy. And then the two slides on the right are true and false activities. One's focused on food safety and another on eating on the run. Next slide, please. Here's some more interactive content. You can see that pregnancy discomfort uh, slide on the left in which participants can choose between pregnancy discomforts. And maybe one person's experiencing more nausea and another more headaches. They can choose which elements to delve into. And then on the right, you see some examples of content that's delivered um, first at the top about babies and responsive feeding and in the bottom about sharing food together as a family. These were a little bit of content that led into a video. Next slide. And here are some examples of the video. So each lesson had a recipe video and a physical activity video. And then this one on the bottom right uh, was a breastfeeding challenges video. This is something that actually the educators encouraged us to uh, in increase the content focus on in this, this curriculum, not just to give information about breastfeeding, but really thinking about challenges people face and making it work for them. So these women in these videos are talking about maybe negative feedback they received by someone in their, their, um, their family or someone in the community about breastfeeding and how they, how they handle it. Next slide, please. And then at the end of the lesson, each participant was asked to set a goal. So they had some uh, options there for that, that the educators could follow up with them on. And then there were also nutrition education reinforcement items that were provided to those who completed the course. So you can see some examples of what was awarded in lesson two. Next slide, please. We collected data again throughout the process with those key informant interviews. One of the really key uh, learnings that we had early on is that most participants would be accessing this course via mobile phone and most likely Android. So that um, was used by the, the instructional designer to make sure that um, you know, our, our content was developed in a way that it worked well with that platform. And then we also um, asked participants midway through, you know, at various junctures and development to just test the content in one on one interviews. They gave us feedback about what they felt was easy to do in terms of enrollment, what they needed, to, uh, really suggested seeing changes there. And then at the end of the pilot, we conducted two focus groups, one with participants in the course and then one with the educators and reviewed those those for themes. And so some of the, the key learnings in those focus groups was to enhance media use, both for recruitment of participants and also engagement throughout the course. So we had discussion boards uh, in the pilot and participants weren't as inclined to use those. Also, in, the educators really felt a need to learn better ways to create trust and engagement with between themselves and their, their audience members in an online environment. So that's a next step for the program as well. And then also encourage the educators encourage us to think about incentives and that would really be useful and helpful for participants that would encourage them to join and, and keep stay engaged in the course. Next slide, please. So a few of the quotes here that participants um, said in the focus group, you can see these ones that are highlighted here are focused on usability. So we really, really did get good feedback about the usability of the course. Some had um, some questions about when modules would open. In the initial pilot, we opened one module per week. Moving forward, we're thinking of opening all modules at the same time so participants can move through at their own pace. Next slide, please. And then participants also just shared some things that they enjoyed learning in the course. They liked getting tips that they could easily apply. And some talked about some values that the course aligned with, such as um, you know, family history of, of um, disease states that they wanted to change in their, their own families. Next slide, please. On the educator end, Relevance was a really big piece that stood out. If the educator felt like you know, their participants were really dealing with many other issues that kept health from being at the forefront, they, they um, wanted to find ways to really make sure that everything they were providing um, was relevant and usable to, to the audience, finding things that the audience could relate with. And then that trust piece again, building relationships 
uh, with their clients with something they were really familiar with in the face-to-face -face environment, but they might need some assistance with learning how to do well in an online environment. Next slide, please. And then again, the educators really spoke to the need of um, using media more for engaging with their audience and creating a community of those who are participating together. Next slide, please. So as we move forward, we've learned some things that we will continue to uh, adapt in the coming pilots. And as many others we see in the SnapEd community are using online tools for delivering education, we look forward to learning together with all of you. Next slide, please. And here's our, our information. My author information is on this slide. If you have questions about this project, feel free to reach out to me. Thank you so much. Good morning, Asna. My name is Erin Resenchuk, a community health specialist um, for SNAP-Ed. Um, uh, Co-lead on this presentation is Teresa Mintz, FNET coordinator, and Sandra Palmer, assistant director for federal nutrition programs. And we are all at Co Alabama Cooperative Extension at Auburn University. Today, I'm going to speak to you about a pro program called Move Alabama, which is a community physical activity challenge that was piloted in year 2022, the spring of last year. We found um, year one to be a huge success and learned a lot. Next slide, please. Move Alabama is a collaboration between two federally funded nutrition ed education programs, SNAP-Ed or Live Well Alabama and FNEP in our state. This program began as a need recognized by a county educator who wanted a way to engage their community in physical activity in a fun, interactive way. Um, conversations happened at the state level and then the Move Alabama pilot year began. The collaborative nature of Move Alabama makes it simple for both nutrition educators to promote and an easy sell for community, community leaders and organizations who want to get involved. So spring 2022, 2022 the pilot year had six um, counties with both FNEP and and snap at educators in them, and um, was also promoted by our extension staff. Um, they were all challenging those six communities in this pilot year. Next slide, please. This eight week community activity challenge is built off of a simple flyer. Um, the flyer was developed to include a total of 25 challenges. These challenges range from general ways to be more physically active in your community to ones that were developed to highlight unique local opportunities for free physical activity, like specific trails, downtown areas, or tourist spots in the community. The completed flyer is then dropped off at specific drop-off points in the local community or emailed to um, our email from Move Alabama. Um, this puts them in a prize or local prize, um, prizes at the community level. One of my favorite pieces of the challenge was the social media engagement. On the flyer, participants are asked to take a photo of themselves and their families being more physically active and doing one of the challenges. Then they post the photo on the Move Alabama Facebook page. This led to some exciting engagement as well as a place where state teams could incorporate, so a place where we could incorporate nutrition and physical activity education. Next slide, please. The encouragement, as you can see, these are some of the, the Facebook posts. Um, the encouragement from county to county and person to person is what makes the challenge so fantastic. Participants were asked to hashtag their county. For example, in one of these, you see hashtag move Coosa County in their post. This helped us see where they were posting from and kept, kept momentum high in that community. Another large piece of this challenge is what we call pop-up challenges. This is where this was done to highlight local destinations and bring community members together as a whole to do a challenge. To give an example, um, we had a couple educators put Easter eggs or pictures of Easter eggs in downtown shopping windows. Um, participants were asked to find the eggs, and then this led to more walking and more traffic in that downtown area. Next slide, please. 
Formative evaluation and qualitative feedback was gathered from both county and educator teams and MOVE Alabama participants after the program. So through this process, the, the highlights of the program, challenges and barriers, and suggestions for future the future of MOVE Alabama were gathered. Here are some highlights and impacts from the pilot year. So some of my favorites are during this eight week challenge. We actually had 361 members in, the, in just those six counties join um, us on our Facebook page. Tons of encouraging posts were posted and lots of um, great comments. So we also had over 75 community partners join us for this challenge who <laughs> encouraged the partnership of the program and um, donated prizes and other pieces. So next slide, please. So in 2023, uh, the actual challenge starts today. So March 1 is the beginning of Move Alabama for the 2023 year. So during our evaluation from the pilot year, we learned a lot, um, but we are now in 50 counties in the state for this year. And we have introduced a partnership with Walker Tracker, which is a physical activity um, tracking software that was also a need from the evaluation phase. And then we've um, definitely increased our marketing efforts a little bit more this year um, for those 50 counties. We are looking forward to seeing what the impacts we get from this year's um, Move Alabama. So next slide, please. And thank you for having us today and feel free to reach out for more information. Hello everyone, my name is uh, Nancy Rogat and I'm the Executive Director of CASAT at the University of Nevada. Uh, I'm with uh, Dr. Annie Lindsay, who's also with the University of Nevada. And uh, we're also presenting with Adrian Markworth. Uh, and we're excited to talk to, uh, today about a new project that we're uh, doing as a collaboration. And it's also nice to see uh, and to hear uh, other participants uh, in this conference talking about their work regarding uh, substance use disorders. And it would be great to get a group of us together to continue uh, to share and, and uh, discuss the information. Next slide. I'm going to do just a brief review of some of the data. Uh, it's really important to remind uh, folks that tens of millions of Americans are uh, have resolved, uh, successfully resolved an alcohol AOD problem, and they do it through a variety of means. Next slide. Uh, I want to talk briefly about setting the stage for our uh, project, um, but uh, the use of opioids and stimulants, uh, primarily methamphetamine and cocaine, has increased by 80% in the past decade. Use of opioids and stimulants has contributed to the overdose epidemic, and a lot of times we don't hear about that. We hear about uh, opioid use leading, uh, or especially fentanyl right now, leading to the overdose, but certainly uh, stimulants like methamphetamine have a significant role. Uh, and you can see here, while overdose deaths due to prescription opioids and heroin are declining, the use and mortality from synthetic drugs like fentanyl and methamphetamine are steeply rising. You can see uh, the resources on, uh, or the citations on this are pretty current. And then co-use of opioids and cocaine, especially co-injection, uh, speedballs, are also associated with an increased risk of overdose. Uh, next slide. And then uh, methamphetamine use has really been endemic in the Western US for decades, especially in rural communities where use is more prevalent uh, than metropolitan areas and methamphetamine associated with an increased risk of overdose uh, regardless of opioid uh, use. Uh, next slide. Uh, I'm going to turn it over to my colleague, uh, Dr. Uh, Annie Lindsay. Yeah, so what opportunities does SNAP-Ed in the United States have to reach these individuals? <clears throat> uh, many of them are rural, 
food insecure and either SNAP eligible or they're currently receiving uh, SNAP benefits. So I think that reaching these individuals is gonna require a super collaborative and holistic approach through a partnership between SNAP educators, um, all of us, and, uh, and the substance use professional community, which is why you know, we invited uh, Nancy to be part of this conversation. It's also important to support and empower nutrition educators to better tailor our programs to those seeking recovery because meaningful participation um, will improve treatment outcomes, re reduce uh, recidivism and re you know, relapse, uh, maximize food security and overall um, health. Next slide, please. So how can SNAP-Ed make a difference? So look briefly at this list of what individuals in recovery for substance use are characterized. They're nutrition deficient from substance use and withdrawal is even worse during that, that sort of detox time. They're losing a lot of nutrients in their body and um, they have low energy and fatigue, very low physical activity levels. Their uh, metabolism is impaired from the substances they're using. They have poor diets um, from drug abstinence as well uh, can also affect their metabolism. They have impaired hunger and fullness cues. So relearning that a lot of them have weight concerns and sleep disorders. So on a daily basis, many of you will encounter women uh, with stimulant disor uh, use disorders, either needing treatment services or already in, in recovery. So, you know, why not augment uh, existing treatment to improve the recovery outcomes by increasing fruit and vegetable consumption and physical activity levels? Next slide, please. So I think we should tailor programs to uniquely reach this audience. And these are just a couple of bullet points that I think would make that work. Understanding basic nutrients um, that the body needs from current deficiencies discussing the role of a healthy diet for successful recovery, incorporating healthy meal planning. Many of these uh, individuals are plagued by time constraints and overwhelming responsibilities. In addition to having families and jobs, they also have regular group meetings they have to attend. They have court appointments, they have drug screens they have to drop, um, um, and they're dealing with this at the same time. So it's very difficult. They don't, a lot of them don't really know how to um, cook and take care of their families. And so we need to teach them that healthy choices on a reasonable budget and really focus on the family as a reunification because many of them are coming from CPS issues. And then of course, encourage teaching physical activity in a way that promotes mental health without adding to the additional burden of going to the gym or something like that. Uh, next slide. So the last thing that I want to mention, and I'll pass it off to Adrian, is that uh, women have even more challenges in this population um, because they're, uh, the reason that they use drugs in the first place and how they manifest in their body and relapse are very much related to nutrition and physical activity. And so for women, we also need to focus on healthy eating and physical alternity alternatives to diet practices, which are very common in women in recovery, which ultimately leads to disordered eating and exercise practices. We should focus on healthy alternatives to the use of energy supplements, um, which can be a gateway to substance use. We need to promote self-esteem and a healthy relationship with the body since weight gain is a common trigger and ultimately utilize strength-based and trauma-informed approaches. We have the tools within SNAP-Ed to really improve these outcomes. And I think it's an exciting time that we're moving into. And I thank Kentucky for the work that they're also doing. So Adrian's gonna wrap us up and tell you some good news if you wanna dig deeper into this. Next slide. Good morning, everyone. So as part of this project, we are doing an in-person training in May for um, folks in California, Guam, Hawaii, Nevada, and Arizona. Um, we're about to start registering for that. But after that, we're going to be preparing an online course that's based on that in-person course. And that'll pretty much be you know, widely open and available to any snap -it educators that are interested in doing it. So if you're interested in kind of being on the list for that or, or knowing when it is, I just put in the chat our newsletter. It'll all come out through the Leah's Pantry newsletter, but we'll try and cross post it everywhere. I'm just not always sure the best way to get to everyone. Uh, but the objectives for the training are to really learn about individual and community effects of stimulant use. So this will be really content heavy by content experts, like really getting us as snap -it educators smart about the actual, you know, kind of how nutrition and um, substance abuse are 
are go together and are impacted. Um, and then we'll we'll also kind of translate that into SNAP-Ed, but it will be a unique training and that we'll really have some terrific subject matter experts making us really, really smart so that we can better design our own programs and modify our own programs for this population. Um, so this is funded by, go to the next slide. I'm not sure, do we need to do all these, Wendy? Um, uh, funded by the Rural Opioid Technical Assistance Regional Center. So next slide for, which is funded by SAMHSA. So it's a combination of SAMHSA funding. And then we're putting in a little bit of training funding for CalFresh Healthy Living Program. Um, and the partners, maybe go to slide 12, are, uh, yeah, these are, this is, this is the states that are involved as well as these um, Hawaii and the outlying areas, and then the partners on this project. One more slide. So those states for the first pilot. Yeah, for the, for, for the first pilot, and then the online training will be for everyone. And then these are all the great partners involved. Um, and then last, just uh, save the date for the May 10th training, which will be for a smaller group. It'll be in person in Sacramento before we open it up. So thanks, everyone. Hello, I'm Krista McCartney. Um, I am a public health specialist and assistant professor at WVU Extension um, and also the SNAP-Ed director um, for West Virginia. So today I'm going to talk about growing collective efficacy using a statewide gardening campaign, a grow this experiment. So a lot of the presentations have been on projects that have taken place. This is more um, Conceptual, so if you bear with me as we walk through this, um, I'd appreciate that. Um, next slide. So just getting to the roots of the issue here, nine out of 10 of all high food insecure counties are rural and eight out of 10 are in the South. Next slide. And talking about those at risk, 15% of all households with children in the US are food insecure, and this is more prevalent with our single mother households, which have almost double the rate of food insecurity of single dads or married couples. Next slide. So while we're talking about risk, um, let's talk about equity in terms of health. So in adults, food insecurity is also associated with higher rates of hypertension, heart disease, hepatitis, stroke, cancer, asthma, diabetes, arthritis, COPD, and kidney disease, 10 chronic conditions. Um, and also in children, this can be associated with asthma, skin allergies, depression, increased visits to the ER, but also a lack of preventative medicine um, like dental visits or mental health um, access. Next slide. So to more closely align efforts to fight food insecurity with health outcomes, the USDA has switched um, using the term food security to now nutrition security. And while it seems to be a small shift um, grammatically, it does have big implications. So food insecurity can easily be seen as an issue of the poor, but if you have money to buy food, lack, um, but if you have the money to buy food, the lack of accessibility of those foods that will promote health aren't always there. So if um, I have money, but I live in a rural community, that may mean I'm um, suffering from nutrition insecurity. So um, this is kind of a, a unifying thing in my mind of, um, of, of bringing folks together around this issue of, of not just a lack of um, food due to economic or social conditions to is there consistent equitable access to healthy, safe, affordable foods that will promote health? Next slide. So in um, 2016, the WVU Food Justice Lab did a report and found that less than 5% of stores in West Virginia offer produce. Many locally owned grocery stores who traditionally offered larger selections have been shuttered due to competition from larger corporate chains. Um, one example in McDowell County, Walmart came in, um, other stores um, closed and then Walmart left, leaving this um, a major food desert in our state. Um, so even if you have the money to buy food, there's a lack of accessibility of those foods to promote health. Um, again, going back to nutrition security issues. 
So what is it about rural communities that are greater at risk? It's because um, rural communities that are sparsely populated and located in very remote locations are not attractive to corporations who control 80% of the food system from seed to slaughterhouse, um, with only 15% of those profits going to farmers. So next slide. What this means is we really need to have kind of this matrix moment. Um, to regain control of the food system, people need to see it for what it is. We need to quit accepting empty shelves and 30 mile drives to the nearest fruit and vegetable. And we also need to quit accepting that any food is good enough if you aren't paying for it. Next slide. Um, so, you know, we have all lived through this kind of like, um, hard times in terms of surviving a global pandemic, and this was closely followed by extreme inflation, um, which are all bad things to, to live through, but maybe the wake up call that folks are um, needing to kind of understand the food system and the impact it's having on them. And we're seeing that now with these high food prices um, that are really a reflection of the cost of inputs of agriculture, but also the lack of shipping containers and truck drivers that are really needed um, to transport this food that is very centralized and, and corporate into these remote communities. Next slide. So what we're talking about is food citizenship. Um, how do we encourage that and engage more people? And this isn't a new concept. So during both world wars, um, the United States citizens engaged in victory gardens um, as a mean of boost, means of boosting morale, um, expressing patriotism, safeguarding against food shortages, and also easing the burden on commercial farmers who were working to feed the troops overseas. Um, next slide. So while it preceded COVID, the Grow This campaign actually hit its stride during the pandemic, going from around 300 participants in its first two years to over 20,000 during COVID. Um, and, and we saw this through different evaluations that the threat of food shortages, health fears, a need for a mental health outlet, and honestly, the fact that people were stuck at home generated a resurgence and an interest in gardening and food preservation. So Grow This um, at its foundation has been a call to action for West Virginia citizens to um, come together around health, economy, and nutrition security. And um, since 2018, over 300,000 residents have participated. Next slide. So the Grow This community is very diverse, but one thing they have in common is a vision for celebrating our West Virginia heritage by growing food, sharing it with neighbors, and teaching the next generation how to do it for themselves. So these are comments that have come from our um, participants. Um, you can go to the next slide. And then the next one. And next slide. So the communication infrastructure theory um, suggests that a storytelling network in combination with context can lead to increased collective efficacy and civic engagement. And that would really be foundational to driving this um, food citizenship and again towards food sovereignty. Um, the Grow This community has naturally been sharing stories as part of their participation in this virtual community, but I think there's an opportunity to further harness this energy for good. Next slide. So this brings the experiment. Um, can we use Grow This um, as a platform for engaging our own WVU Extension faculty, staff, and colleagues in collective implementation and evaluation of efforts to build nutrition security. So what that looks like is, next slide, um, creating a, a challenge system very similar to what Alabama was talking about, um, creating challenges and then um, setting up a point system to really engage people in this effort. Um, and these things would be things that our, our extension colleagues are, are very used to doing and part of their general um, 
efforts, but we're just really um, creating a, a, a challenge system around that. So for example, we want to maximize production of food. So um, we can earn points for each person that participates in garden-based education, um, additional points for weighing and reporting the quantity of produce grown, um, and calculating a value of that produce. Next slide. Um, encouraging education and sustainability through challenges like hosting a plant exchange or intergenerational um, gardening events, composting workshops, seed saving workshops, um, and then what are those PSE things that su can support sustainability of those efforts, like creating a tool library or composting stations or seed libraries? Next slide. And then helping people to save money using our families and health um, colleagues. So hosting food preservation workshops, and then also, again, weighing and reporting the amount of food preserved and, and the value of that food, again, contributing to this idea of nutrition security and um, production and preservations of food. Next slide. Um, for our family nutrition program staff and SNAP ed educators, again, something they're used to doing, but but making this um, part of a challenge is let's get those foods on the menu. So um, one point for each meal or snack serve that contains those grow this crops and then maybe bonus points for um, getting those locally or through a school or community garden. Next slide. Um, so how are we going to facilitate this through SNAP-Ed and, and other external funding? We are planning to create county kits that will include scales, um, container garden bags, and different marketing um, options for the counties to use in their efforts um, to engage participants and carry out the challenges. Next step, or next slide, sorry. And then um, using a dashboard internally with our um, extension colleagues that reports back to them their efforts. So whether that be um, mapping function or also, you know, demographics of people they're reaching, um, the number of points in each county, you know, um, a leaderboard per se. So this is just an example of, of what that dashboard might look like. And again, this is part of that um, storytelling, you know, internally um, to build that collective efficacy and also that civic engagement. And like I said, we're still in kind of this conceptual model. We are doing a small pilot right now of, of challenging a, a small group of faculty with an extension to get involved with this. Um, but if you'd like to learn more about Grow This and our movement, you're welcome to scan this QR code or um, join our Facebook or Instagram accounts or reach out to me directly. Thanks. Hello, everyone. Um, thank you for inviting us to present this amazing physical activity intervention. Everybody loves line dancing. My name is Norma Lysenko with Innovative Health Solutions. Good morning. My name is Melinda Van Egden, and I'm with the California Department of Aging. Next slide. California has over 5 million older adults and at least... 500,000 qualify for SNAP-Ed services. Next slide. California has over 5 million older adults and, oh, sorry. <laughs> California is very diverse state in culture, race, ethnicity, geography, and urban versus rural settings. In 2021, assessments showed a need for new curricula that is culturally relevant. CDA is pleased to work with a local area agency on aging to develop a new curriculum. Everybody loves line dancing. Next slide. As mentioned, in 2021, Innovative Health Solutions was tasked to create a line dance uh, curriculum for older adults under the Napa Solano Area Agency on Aging Guidance. The idea came about when during a nutrition education class that I was teaching at a senior center, I noticed a group of more than 20 older women meeting weekly in a nearby room to dance. Some of these women would come over to my class to taste the recipe. I proceeded to engage with them and ask them about this dance class, and they said it was line dancing, 
and that they came together weekly on a volunteer basis to practice line dance choreography. There was no paid instructor and the choreography was provided by volunteer participants. Although I thought this was an amazing opportunity for us to explore creating a line dancing um, curriculum as a physical activity intervention for older adults. As you see here, there are six lesson plans in the pilot curriculum. The lessons plans are water wisdom, fabulous fruits, veggie variety, whole grains, healthy fats, protein power. Um, we chose the content for the lessons plans for the lesson plans for from participant suggestions. Next slide. Leah's pantry, who has developed other nutrition curriculum, education curriculum, assisted us with the initial content and graphics. And as I mentioned, the curriculum has six lessons plans, lesson plans, although we are considering expanding it to two, 10 lesson plans after the pilot. The curriculum also has a nourishment newsletter with nutrition messages and recipe suggestions. We have also created a flyer for promotion that go along with the curriculum for branding. Next slide. Everybody Loves Line Dancing has four different focus areas of music that include soul line dancing, Latin line dancing, country line dancing, and Filipino line dancing. We use trauma-informed practices in the creation of the nutrition education messages. We currently offer the classes at community centers, senior centers, and low-income senior apartments. We also plan to expand to assisting living facilities, veteran centers, and parks and open spaces. Next slide. The goal of the program is are to provide a cultural relevant physical activity intervention with nutrition topics and social engagement. Some of the benefits are physical health, mental, emotional health, it fosters happiness, increases self-confidence, stamina, balance, brain stimulation, cardiovascular health, social connection, enhances mood, confidence, and much, much more. Line dancing can be a low impact physical activity intervention that can be modified for different mobility levels. At any time, participants can stop and take a break. We have chairs all around the room and participants can keep a chair next to them for balance while they dance. We also are in discussions with experts to create a curriculum for special needs and disabled adults. Next slide. The impact has been amazing. In less than three months, we have been able to provide the pilot curriculum to six counties in Northern California. We have provided eight six class series for a total of 48 classes. We have had almost 800 total duplicated participants. Many of these participants have a attended more than four classes per session. We have almost 300 undupl unduplicated participants. We have been at eight different locations. We have been able to collect 81 pre and post matched surveys. Again, all of this in less than three months. And the pilot program ends in September of this year. CDA has learned the value in listening to older adults. The line dancing classes have had outstanding attendance with waiting lists. This has shown the importance of building programs based on people's needs and interests. Next slide. Here you can see a picture of two different locations we have where we have over 40 participants coming back every week. We provide classes three times a week and many participants attend all of them. Next slide. This is a video we have created that shows the benefits of line dancing from the participants' perspective. It also provides a testimony and success story from one of our line dance participants who has battled several types of cancer and uses line dancing as a component for her mental health treatment. This, uh, the link will be in the chat. So please, it's about four or five minutes uh, video if you like to watch the full video. And also uh, you can watch some of the line dance choreography that we have created that goes along with the curriculum. Next slide. Thank you so much for listening. Here's my information. Uh, please contact me if you have any questions or are interested in the pilot or the curriculum. And I will uh, put the uh, link to in the chat. Hi, everybody. Welcome to Growing Garden Partnerships in Massachusetts. 
My name is Carol Guerin. Next slide. I work for UMass Extension Nutrition Education Program, SNAP-Ed, and I'm going to be telling you about our PSE garden programming. Next slide in the Southeast area of Massachusetts. So our programming began with direct debt and building trust in the community and relationships. And then we built partnerships and assess the needs and the um, resources in the community. And then we built programming. Um, our programming uh, has started out with direct ed, but has gone into school and community gardens, after school, um, recess garden clubs, um, gardens at um, housing authorities, and gone all the way to mobile markets at um, housing authorities and community centers for SNAP participants. Um, our programming, uh, next slide, thank you. So part of the reason why our programming has been successful is because of the partnerships we built early on. And there are certain um, committee meetings and collaborator meetings that I would suggest to people to build, build partnerships. One of them would be our Chana meetings. In Massachusetts, we have community health network areas. In your state, they could be called hospital community benefit areas. Um, these uh, these um, organizations do a community health assessment every three years. So it's a great place to put your uh, finger on the beat of what's going on in the community. Um, and a lot of our partnerships I met at those Chana meetings. School wellness committee meetings are great for making relationships with uh, superintendents, principals, school nurses, and um, food service departments if you want to do a um, garden to cafeteria dish. Advisory committees such as uh, the Plymouth County Sheriff's Department Farm Advisory Committee that I'm on, our county sheriff has a department has a huge farm which grows about 30,000 pounds of food which they donate to our food bank every year. And um, those are really, that's great partnership. Uh, housing authority meetings are great because you get to build a relationship with the director of housing, as well as gaining access to doing programming where people live, where people cook, and where people eat. Another great partnership I would suggest is finding a farmer who has SNAP payment processing capacity. Next slide, please. Some of our partnerships here, you can see in this slide, uh, the Sheriff's Department allows us to use their greenhouses to start our seedlings for our school and community gardens. We start about 1,400 seedlings every year in April and transplant them in May and June to school and community gardens. In the center, you see we, when we harvest the produce through volunteers and families at school and community gardens, we make it available in the summer at summer feeding sites during COVID. Uh, people could come pick up fresh vegetables and fruits and herbs from the summer feeding site. And on the left, you see, we started a fruit orchard at the library. It's um, apple trees, pear trees, and native pawpaw. Next slide, please. Here you see uh, in our relationship with the public schools, uh, in the top left, you see a principal every year, she lets each grade level plant a bed with the seedlings that we start. And then in the center photograph, you see the three sisters garden, the kale. And in every school and community garden, we grow the ingredients for a tomato sauce that is served in the public schools in October on food day. Next slide, please. Another partnership we have with food pantries, we help them maintain their gardens, help them rebuild their beds. Um, and we work with the volunteers to grow the food. And when people come to the food pantry, as you can see on the left, we make the produce available um, at pickup. Participants can also volunteer on the gardens as well, which is great. And at all of our programming, we always give out recipes and um, we teach nutrition education and uh, healthy cooking skills, et cetera. Next slide, please. Our housing authority partnership has been fantastic. It started out with direct ed. And then right before COVID, we did a patio garden at one of the housing sites where the uh, uh, residents could grow their own tomatoes, basil, peppers. And we soon found out that that was great. People were getting out there exercising and gardening, but 
it wasn't produ providing enough produce for everyone to have some. So that turned into the bottom photograph of sharing our produce from the school and community gardens every Wednesday. Um, residents could come down to like a farmer's market where they could just take the produce. And that turned into this year, um, we brought mobile farmer's market to the five housing locations where the participants who have SNAP benefits um, can use their SNAP card. And in Massachusetts, we have something called the Healthy Incentive Program Benefit. It works off a grant. And if you have SNAP uh, benefits, according to your household size, you can either get 40 60 or $80 of free vegetables every month. So through our mobile markets program, we've already done over a thousand SNAP hip purchases where people can utilize that benefit of getting um, free local produce every month. So if you'd like any more information, we have a resource slide that you can take a photograph of or email us. Thank you. Hi everyone, my name is Darby Gavin. I'm a nutrition educator with the Cape Cod Cooperative Extension and I'm going to talk to you about our cultural community gardening program that we implemented during the 2021 growing season. Next slide, please. Um, so this program was created to increase access to culturally competent crops native to Brazilian and Haitian Creole cuisines. We partnered with local farms and community gardens to grow and distribute these culturally diverse crops. Uh, we had approximately 12 master gardeners volunteering that contributed to the project. They helped with initial installation and planting, and there was also a group that checked on the gardens weekly. We had two commercial growers, Chatham Bars and Farm in Brewster and Prairie Dog Farms in Falmouth, both of which received a grant to grow the crops and the produce was given to local food pantries. Um, in total, we had four garden sites. Each site had two raised beds with the exception of the Hyannis Public Library, which had one raised bed. Um, in conjunction with the gardens, we also developed and distributed over 750 multilingual cookbooks. The cookbooks were in English, Haitian Creole, and Portuguese. Um, they were provided to all of the agencies and churches that had garden sites installed. Uh, the YMCA received them for their preschool sites as a part of a Welcome Week event for immigrant families new to Cape Cod. Um, the Falmouth Coalition for Families and Chatham Elementary School also took cookbooks. They were made uh, available at public libraries. And in addition to the 750 that we distributed, we also had um, another 250 that were distributed at SNAP-Ed program sites. Um, the images on the screen on your left, you can see the Barnesville County Food Access Coordinator with a cultural garden program participant. And then on the right, you can see a crop called chilo that we harvested. It's also called scarlet eggplant. Um, it's very popular in Brazilian cuisine and can be cooked in many ways. And um, all of the crops in that photo were harvested from the garden sites. Next slide, please. Um, this slide is just a vis visual representation of our 2021 partnerships for the Cultural Community Garden Program. And I just like to highlight the various garden sites because they truly serve a, um, a diverse group of um, people of all ages, populations, backgrounds. Um, the Tri-Colored Wheel is the Faith Assembly Church of Cape Cod. We also had a site at the Hyannis Public Library, uh, the Boys and Girls Club of Cape Cod and the Seventh-day Adventist Church and Food Pantry. Um, and I also want to highlight the MDAR logo. That's the Massachusetts Department of Agriculture. This program was made possible through a grant from them. We also had funding from Cape Cod 5 and um, the Buy Fresh Buy Local team and Mar Master Gardener team, both with the Cape Cod Cooperative Extension were integral to the development and implementation of this program. Next slide. And this is just our resources. We have some um, examples of success stories, both in Plymouth and statewide. We have links to the curriculums that were used in Carol's direct uh, education in her gardening program. Um, and the PDFs of the cookbooks are also available online. Thank you. Hello, my name is Elena Serrano, and I'm the director of Virginia SNAP-Ed. I'll be presenting in place of Austin Brooks and will be co-presenting with Maria Denuncio, a graduate student within our program, on behalf of our recipe team. Next slide, please. The goal of today's session is to provide an overview of print and digital food education resources that we've developed as part of Virginia SNAP-Ed to reach a variety of diverse audiences. Next slide, please. 
Over the past few years, we have revised and designed a variety of print and digital food education resources to better reach a variety of audiences. Um, we wanted to ensure that we represented the cultural diversity of Virginia and our participants, that we featured foods that were available and being promoted at PSE settings that we were working at, um, that we recognized a range of cooking competencies and skills, as well as learning styles, and that we adapted to shifts in trends in social media, such as the creation of reels and other videos. Next slide, please. The driving force um, for investing in all of these food education resources is that we believe that food education resources that address a range of cooking competencies, learning styles, as well as taste preferences can help increase interest in trying new nutritious foods and recipes, complementing our direct education. Um, food education, as well as food education resources, can also serve as recruitment tools for comprehensive SNAP-Ed classes and ideally and ultimately will create demand for healthier options at PSE site settings that we work in. I did wanna note that print, it still remains very popular among our participants. Next slide, please. To provide context to these resources, in Virginia SNAP-Ed, we have three different types of food education that we permit with direct education to connect nutrition with food. Um, Hands-on food preparation with client participation is endorsed within comprehensive nutrition education. Smart samplings or taste tests, these are more popular with groups such as large youth groups. Um, and locations where food preparation may not be possible. Finally, food demonstrations. These are mostly used at PSE sites, such as farmer's markets, food pantries, gardens, as well as our Shop Smart, Eat Smart retail partners. As a result of these different types of food education, we needed different resources to address these. Next slide, please. The first resource that we addressed was our traditional recipe sheet. Um, we made basically two different changes. One was that we included the updated nutrition facts panel. Again, we really wanted to connect nutrition with our recipes and food education. The second was that we ensured that the MyPlate food icons were included with the, within each recipe sheet. These recipe sheets are also available in Spanish. And then in order to um, market our programs, we, we asked our peer educators and our SNAP-Ed agents to print the recipe sheets on one side with our marketing flyer on the other. And then that way we would also feature some of the food education we'd be doing in programs. Next slide, please. Hi, my name is Maria Denunzio. Uh, our first series of food education resources is our Look and Cook series. And we created these because many participants may not have confidence in the kitchen. So we designed these resources to reduce the potential intimidation factor of cooking. Uh, we took action shots for creation of recipes and we took these photos in either home or teaching kitchens so that they are very manageable and simple looking. We purposely use simple dishware and easy to follow instructions. And the recipes that are included in this look and cook series were solicited from our SNAP-Ed educators and agents. Next slide, please. Our next series is the What to Do With series. And we created these in response to our food pantry partners asking us for a one-page handout on foods that were unfamiliar to their clients. Growers were providing donations to food pantries and clients didn't really know what to do with these foods. So the What to Do With series includes anything and everything that you would have to know about that specific food, including basic nutrition, storage tips, and simple preparation instructions. There are also two recipes on each What to Do With sheet. And these recipes are really different types of recipes so that individuals can find what works for them. 
All foods in this What to Do With series were generated by our pantry partners. Next slide, please. Next, we have our Build Your Own series. And these were inspired by quick service restaurant or the salad bar model restaurant. Uh, Build Your Own series are designed for the creative cook or individuals who are comfortable with creating some standard meals. And these resources show how families can tailor recipes to their personal preferences by swapping out ingredients. Next slide, please. So the left side of this slide shows a list of all of the Build Your Own sheets that we have available. Most importantly, this series allows people to tailor recipes to their own needs and to swap flavor profiles and ingredients. This series also allows our educators to do the same thing and tailor recipes to different cultural groups that they may be working with. Next slide. Our last uh, educate food education series is short real videos. And we share these videos on our social media channels. These offer another mode for food education and are videos that show step-by-step -step creation of recipes in home kitchens. These videos are also allowed to be shared by our participants on their personal pages so that we can generate interest around our clients' favorite recipes. Next slide. Okay, thank you. And as, if anyone is interested in these resources to use or modify, we are happy to share the files. Thank you. Thank you so much for the Block One speakers. We're going to go ahead now and move 